Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 326, Interview with Robert Lofthaus about his upcoming book, Honor Through Sacrifice, the story of one of America's greatest military leaders, covering the career of Gordon Joseph Lippmann. Lippmann fought in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, the winner of 17 commendations, including the Distinguished Service Cross, the Silver Star, the Purple Heart, and the Presidential Unit Citation for Extraordinary Heroism in Action Against an Armed Enemy. Gordon Lippmann is an example of living life to its fullest. As for the book, pre-sale details will be announced on the website www dot hold the line dot press for a July August time frame. Also, check in on the site for additional stories about America's gallant men who won the freedoms we enjoy today. Mr. Lofthaus, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Ray. Uh, appreciate you inviting me to be on your show. Absolutely. So again, the book is called Honor Through Sacrifice, the story of one of America's greatest military leaders. Now, I have to ask, because I read this book like three times in in prepping for this. So when I first read your book about Gordon Joseph Lippmann, I was like, yeah, okay, Ray, you could be doing a lot better job living a fuller life, you know, really embracing your family and, and friends and, and, and skills and goals and desires, because that was the kind of guy Lippmann was. He just, he just, he owned himself. He had his heart on his sleeve. And that really comes through in your book. So, and feel free to tell us about some of his awards, the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star. So we get an idea of this man, but I have to ask, as you are related to Lippmann, do you feel that push even more than I do to, to make as much of your life as you can? And while you're answering that or while you're thinking about that, if you could give us an idea uh, of how this book came about. Sure. I, uh, I, I met Gordon when I was, I was 15. He's my first cousin. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the first opportunity I had to meet with him because uh, living in a small town in, in, in southeast Kansas, we didn't get out much. We didn't, didn't travel. And, and he was on the road all the time being in the army. Right. Right. So, um, at, at the time that I met him, he was, he was 42. I was 15. Um, you know, our, our families had a great time together. And then, uh, he, he, uh, was shipped off to, to Vietnam shortly after that. So I, I knew him briefly and, and I had heard family stories about him. Um, right. Uh, eventually, when I, I started, uh, when I picked up my, my family genealogy and started doing that, that research, I, uh, I, I wanted to write something about um, a, uh, a family member, um, an ancestor that had, had done something great. And, and as I was looking through um, a, a number of, of options in, in my family tree, I kept coming back to, to Gordon Lippman. Sure. Um, He's, uh, he's the most uh, highly decorated member of, of my family. Um, he, he did some wonderful things in, in uh, uh, combat situations. Um, you know, when he, when he joined the Army in 1943, he was 18, hadn't yet graduated from high school. In fact, I think he was, uh, he, I think he left high school when he was a junior. Right. Um, and um, he ended up... Uh, uh, a little more than a year after graduating from boot camp, uh, leading grown men into combat uh, at the age of 19. Mm-hmm. So um, the man had had great fortitude. He had he had great courage. Um, everybody that I had spoken to in my family that knew him only had had very complimentary things to say about him. Right. Um, and and. Uh, a, a leader of, of men, both in his, his uh, private life and, and his military life. Mm-hmm. Um, his family adored him. Um, and I, I just, as, I, as I dug in more and learned more and more about him, uh, I, I grew to appreciate him uh, a lot more. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I wish I would, had known him when I was younger and had been around him longer, um, I think I, I would have turned out to be a, a better person myself. 
Right. Now, I have to ask, because um, I, I have five kids, four daughters, and, you know, you want to be a good role model for them. So I find this kind of thing fascinating. A lot of what, what is that saying? Um, leaders aren't born, they're made or whatever. But I just get the feeling this guy was born with his head squarely on his shoulders. But there were people in his life who helped him form to become the kind of man and leader that 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 you're you're talking about. There's there's coaches, Boy Scouts, um, yeah. relatives in his family. I think he was even in the school play or something like that. Can you give us an idea, maybe, of some of his formative years and the people who might have helped make this young man into the absolute stellar leader that he was? Sure, I, I would I would have to start with his mother um, mm-hmm. back in back in the in the. Uh, uh, middle of the of the 20th century when when uh, women weren't so prominent in in business uh, right. uh, she was a, a leader herself she she started a, a local chapter of uh, the uh, dar the daughters of the american revolution mm-hmm. uh, she was a, a co-founder of a, of a local chamber of commerce um, uh, she she uh, she started her own grocery store and ran that for about 40 or 45 years, um, most of that on her own, um, as her, her husband had died. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think he, he drew a lot of inspiration and a lot of his strength, uh, from his mother, right. um, during, you know, in school, he was, he was athletic. He was, uh, involved in, in sports. He was, um, he was actually a journalist of sorts. He, he, uh, uh, was uh, uh, voted vice president of a of a, uh, a regional uh, high school um, uh, journalistic society uh, made up of about eight eight different high schools in uh, Northwest uh, South Dakota, mm-hmm. um, and he um, you know he I think he was a born leader. I think he uh, he developed his skills uh, by being a member of Boy State. Um, he was a boy scout. Um, he was, uh, you know, in, involved in the, in the school theater and, and, uh, and in the sports activities, he was also a member of the, of the cheer team. Um, <laughs> right. so he was, you know, he was a cheerleader. Um, and I think, I think those skills helped him in his adult life when he was going into combat because, uh, he found himself in, in positions where, uh, not only did he have to lead his his uh, troops into into battle, but in in some cases he had to rally them to come back and 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 fight the enemy. And uh, he was involved in in uh, the Battle of the Bulge as well as uh, um, an action in in North Korea, um, mm-hmm. where um, you know his his troops his platoon was was pushed back and they had to rally back and 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 uh, defeat the enemy to 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 move the the line ahead so um he had a, a number of, of occasions where where uh, you know those skills came to the forefront and he was able to uh, to display them he was his his uh, uh, battalion commander in in the 517th parachute infantry regiment was um a man named uh bill boyle um they they nicknamed him wild bill boyle because he was um he was he was a military uh military man he was a combat officer he he graduated from from west point uh in 1939 and 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 he was very much involved in in combat during world war ii um and he, you know, it, it was said about him that, that he would drop rank with anybody that challenged his authority. Um, and I think some of that had to rub off on, on his men. And, and uh, um, when Gordon was in Korea, um, I think he displayed that. He, uh, he found himself in, in, in a situation where uh, his... Um, his company was pinned down by, by uh, enemy machine gunners uh, while they were trying to, uh, to take uh, a, a position on, on a hill. 
Mm-hmm. And he ran out of ammunition. Ammunition. He uh, he ran out of his grenades. He ran out of his his uh, uh, ammunition. And he started throwing his his C rations uh, <laughs> at the machine gunners uh, to distract them so that his company could advance on the the position. And they they eventually overtook the the enemy. And he was uh, he was awarded a distinguished service cross uh, for that action wow. overall. That, that's incredible. Yeah, I remember that part of the, the book, the story. And uh, I also remember that I was thinking it was a bit ironic uh, in that this kid clearly was the, the total package. I mean, there's no telling what he could have achieved in life um, if there hadn't been World War II, if there hadn't been Korea, if there hadn't been Vietnam. But that's the way the, the larger universe works. So that's what he's going to go into. But uh, I think you conveyed in the book that he did love um being in the in the armed forces with a set of brothers and and they looked out for each other so again i think that was something that he was okay with but sometimes you can't just help think oh my good goodness this guy's got so much potential but a bigger cause needs him and i think he had no trouble with that and again like you said he probably got so much from his mom if there's something that needs to be doing you just get up and do it and don't spend any time complaining about it but and that reminds me of his training, there were some of the funniest stories in there. Besides the intense training that these had to guy, these guys had to go through, and I'll get you to to tell us about some of that. But I absolutely loved it when some of the people who joined up with the parachutists were told by some doctor who should have his degree checked that, oh, you're afraid of heights? Well, maybe you should be learn to jump out of planes. That'll help cure it. Oh, are you a criminal? Oh, well, maybe you should join the army. That'll wipe your record clean. I don't know if that really worked that way, but if I guess if they survived the war, uh, that would help them a lot with their criminal record. So, the, so there's a lot going into this. There's a lot of people from different societies going into the um, um, to the 517th, not exactly cream of the crop. And, and of course, Gordon has got to work with them. But like you said, he does seem to be a natural leader and he does seem to have this ability to size people up and to get maximum results from them. Yeah, uh, he, um, he he definitely um, took the challenge and, and stepped up to it uh, whenever he was faced with um, opportunity or uh uh, or uh, the enemy trying to, to face him down. He he was uh, he was a full package. I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, but he's going into training at eighteen, and like you said, he has not finished high school. There's going to be people in there who come from the not wrong side of the tracks, but certainly tougher side of the tracks. But when you get into the army, I mean, and and I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman. I'm not sure if it was Wild Bill or someone else, but as they're going through training, the the their commander damn near wanted perfection. They wanted marksmen. They wanted these people to be able to jump out of planes, hand-to-hand combat. They wanted them to be able to think on their feet. So this training, and you describe it very well in your book, was very intense for these people, even for an 18-year-old who's probably already in very good shape. Yep. I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read a quote from... Um, mm from another book that, that I used as, as one of my sources, a book called Battling Buzzards. Mm-hmm. Um, it tells uh, the odyssey of the 517th uh, Regimental Compact Team between 43 and 45. Um, and, the, and the quote that I pulled out of there uh, said that, that, uh, um, that the Army was convinced by 1943 that the assault upon Nazi-held Europe would yield swiftly to elite troops. So the army created parachute regimental combat teams, uh, drawing on on volunteers willing to hurl themselves from airplanes and hit the ground fighting. So a lot of these guys who signed up uh, became paratroopers because they got an extra 50 bucks in in combat pay Ah. uh, by being paratroopers. And and, um, a lot of them were, were very athletic, uh, a lot of them were, were rough guys, but there were, uh, there was a combination. They, they really did, um, uh, cover the spectrum from, from, uh, um, you know, the guy from the, from the wrong side of the tracks to, uh, to, uh, good guys. And, and mm-hmm. some of them were veterans. Um, one of their, one of their lieutenants was a, a veteran of, uh, 
the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, and, uh, you know, they had a, a wide variety of, of guys that, that, uh, that they took into these units. The, the, uh, the, the regiment size itself was about 800 men, but they, they would interview, um, up to 3000 recruits, um, that wanted to be in the, in the, uh, um, 517th and, and they'd pare it down to 800. Wow. So they really were very particular in, in, in who they selected to become a member of this team. That's and that wasn't just the 517th. That was, that was for all of the, the parachute teams that, that uh, the army was training them. And the, you may recall the, the, the 506th, um, easy company that, um, uh, was, uh, referred to as the band of brothers. Mm -hmm. They, they trained at Camp Tekoa a year before Gordon's unit, uh, trained there. So they got the same kind of training, um, same kind of guys. If you watch, uh, that band of brothers series, you'll, you'll see, uh, a lot of character development through, uh, not only their training, but as they, as they went into, uh, uh, combat and, and, and between their, their different combat situations. Um, these guys, they, they trained together. They spent a year or more training together before they ever went to combat. So they went into combat as a team. They didn't go to comp. They weren't really, they weren't sent there as, uh, you know, one guy replacing somebody else. Uh, right. uh, they went as a team, so they knew each other. They uh, they had worked with each other, lived with each other, drank with each other uh, every day and night for a year. Um, so they had a, a great affinity for each other and knew knew what they could expect, and knew they knew who the, the the strong guys were. They knew who the weak guys were, and they knew what they had to do to pull the the uh, companies or the platoons together to be able to accomplish their missions. Yeah. So uh, am I saying it right? They were at Camp Tekoa in Georgia. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but uh, yep. I would, I would not want to run up that hill. And I imagine because you, <laughs> you were talking about how many times a day they had to run or double time it or march everywhere. I mean, these guys were in top physical condition. Now, you can be in top physical condition. You can be mentally and emotionally tough, you know, after that year of training, that's all well and good. But all of that was immediately put to the test, not fighting the Germans, but just trying to cross the Atlantic. They're on this big boat. You've got the U-boat menaces. You've got the boats going up and down on the waves. You could be tough, but I imagine this was quite a challenge for a lot of those young men. Yeah, um, you know, going, um, being at sea and, and, and going across the North Atlantic, of course, you had the North Atlantic storms to oh, yeah. deal with. Yeah, most of these, most of these guys had never been on the ocean before. So I'm sure there was a little bit of seasickness <laughs> occurring. Right. Right. Um, and, and as they were getting closer to Europe, of course, they started running into the U boat. Wolf packs and the and the uh, Luftwaffe that were um, trying to to bomb the ships out of the water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it had to be a, a harrowing experience because on these troop ships you would have um, thousands of, of troopers who who couldn't really do anything because they're so packed in together. Right. Um, but. Um, and, and when the, when the U-boats attack them or the, the uh, German aircraft attack them, you know, what do they do? They, they, they throw on their, um, their life vest and they run up to the, up to the deck, getting ready to jump into the water. Um, but then you have, you have the aircraft coming down to, to shoot at them. So it's like, where do you go? Do you go up to the deck where you're going to dodge uh, dodge bullets, or you stay down below and wait for the, the torpedo to to sink the boat? Jeez. Um, so it had to be a, a a scary place for for most of those guys. Uh, you know, not knowing where to where to go, where to be on the boat, and and you know, there is no safe place really, except exactly. when the boat lands in in uh, Europe. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. There is no safe place. And I've got to think that for the vast majority of these boys, this is probably the first time 
they're outside of the United States. I mean, all this is new and now you're on a giant boat and people are shooting at you. I mean, wow, that's a lot to take in. Yeah. And, and so, so there are fireworks, right? They're, they're, uh, yeah. if, if you're under attack at night, you got all the, all the tracer rounds that are, are, uh, flying back and forth in the sky and, and, uh, uh, all the noise and the commotion on the ship. So, you know, for a young guy, it's an exciting time, an exciting place to be, but but scary at the same time. So they're trained up, they're in top physical condition, they're a good team. And like you said, they know themselves and they know each other. And that's very important for any kind of uh, sized unit. So it's May of 1944, the 517th you know, they are on the ship, they get through, they go through the Mediterranean, and they finally reach Italy. And as you said, they are highly trained, but they're untested. This is going to be their first go around. So they're, they're landed, they go in country, they're to the northwest of Rome, I believe. Uh, Can you give us an idea of what they were expected to do, considering this is their uh, first real combat? And how did they do? Sure, they were, they were assigned to, um, to support, um, what was referred to at the time as the Texas Army, which was uh, uh, another division that had already been in Italy and 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 had been through combat, had been through uh, Anzio, and in, in the the Battle of Anzio had just taken place and had finished. Uh, uh, that was a six month battle to to take Anzio. So the the uh, allies were moving inland and pushing the Germans up north into the into the Alps, mm-hmm. and the 517th was assigned to uh, to go support that effort. So um, as um, as they they uh, moved north, um, the uh, uh, the the army started fighting up into the hills and and going into the the Alps and the and the hills in northern Italy, um, it's it's not uh, it's not easy to get through there because you you've got uh, you know valleys and ravines and 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 uh, mm-hmm. uh, and the hillside that you have to fight on and you're you're fighting uphill for the most part. Uh, the uh, artillery battalion was was. Uh, having their units leapfrog each other to try to keep pushing the the uh, the front line forward. The uh, 517th uh, actually captured uh, Montessario um, and uh, Monte Peloso. Almost said Monte Pelosi, um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but. Um, so they were they were in combat there for for about uh, two two to four weeks, and then they were pulled out. Uh, they had accomplished their missions, mm-hmm. uh, but they were pulled out because uh, there was something uh, something big afoot. The the uh, this was in in June, uh, late June, and as you know, uh, D Day occurred on June sixth. And the Allies were pushing the the German army eastward into uh, the, the center and, and east of France. Um, there had been a, a a battle plan to invade southern France that was put on hold um, because they thought that the that the Allies thought that they could accomplish a lot more psychologically and, and, and physically by um, going into Italy and pushing the Germans up into the, into the Alps. Yeah. But this, this, uh, uh, this mission in uh, Southern France was, was uh, brought back out of mothballs, so to speak. And, and they, uh, uh, they put it back together. Um, it was almost as big as the, the D-Day invasion Mm-hmm. Uh, because they had the, the paratroopers that were were uh, engaged to to land behind German lines in southern France, and then they had a, a a large beach invasion that was that was scheduled to occur as well. Uh, so it was it was I think it was a, a replica of, of D Day in in the, in the sense of the the magnitude and the the number of units that were involved both. Uh, U.S. troops, British, French, uh, and and other nations were involved in this, and so the the 517th was uh, they were flown in uh, early in the morning of um, 
I think it was August 15th. Mm -hmm. So it was a little over a month after D-Day. Um, and um, they were they were flown into to southern France and dropped. And, uh, of course, you know, whenever they run a paratrooper uh jump they they put they send pathfinders out to to light the way and 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 give the the pilots an idea of, of where their drop zones are mm -hmm. well in this particular case just about everybody missed their drop drop zone oh. um and so they had to once they got on the ground they had to scramble around and, and try to figure out where where they were how far they were off course and what they had to do to to get back to their rally points um, so it was, you know, it was, it, it was a lot of chaos. Of course, when you, when you go into combat, you have a lot of chaos. Um, but, um, Gordon was, was, uh, uh, commended for his actions in Southern France during Operation Dragoon. And, um, some of his actions there actually led to a battlefield commission where, where, uh, uh at the age of 19, he was promoted to uh, second lieutenant. That's um, amazing. So again, and you know, a 19 year old second lieutenant uh, never graduated from high school, leading grown men into combat. I, yeah. and that that just continues to amaze me. Yeah. Now I remember this part of your book because when you were talking about when the five um, seventeenth was first getting involved, and you're right. I mean, there's a lot of mountains and hills in Italy that's perfect for defense. So they're doing their part. They're helping push the Germans north. But right away, because of the nature of, of the style of fighting, they start taking casualties, uh, but they do slug it out for a couple of weeks and they could put in reserve. And even though they missed D-Day, you're right, they're part of uh, Operation Dragoon. And the casualties were pretty intense. I think I got from your book like 500 casualties, you know, wounded and then an another 102 men killed in action. So even though they're still young and this is kind of their second challenge. Um, they did do their part. They did carry it out well, but they did pay the price for it. But I think, I think that probably their officers knew this was going to be ugly for a while because the Germans, it's not exactly like anybody thinks of them as quitters. So even though you've landed in Normandy, you've landed in Southern France, this is still going to be ugly for a long time. And they're just going to have to slug it out with these very tough professional soldiers the German soldiers who've already been fighting for years, but they're able to pull it off. And like you said, Gordon was given a, a battlefield commission. That's pretty amazing at the age of 19. Very impressive. Yeah. And, and uh, um, so they, they had two weeks of combat in Italy and then um, a little over two months in Southern France. Mm. And then they were pulled out um, actually a little over three months uh, in Southern France. And then they were pulled out and, and, uh, given R and R and they were sent to, uh, and I'm probably going to say this wrong. Sasson France. Okay. Which I always was, say it wrong. Which, so it's okay. <laughs> so that, that is a, um, that's a, a, a town in, in, uh, farther up in, in, into the Northern end of France that, um, they that was behind um, the uh, battle line, so that was that was in the rear, and and that was a, a an area that the that the Allies used to uh, give their soldiers a, a break from battle. So they would rotate a combat unit back to to give them some R and R, uh, allow the unit to to re-equip and and fix you know fix their weapons and mm -hmm. and fix their their uh, vehicles that that were shot up and. <laughs> and uh, give give them some training and you know a chance to take a hot shower and a chance to have some hot food um, get a little bit of entertainment of course the USO was was prominent there um, so the and, and the USO by you know in and of itself is a is a big story uh, the the kind of support uh, and rest and relax relaxation that they gave to the troops was was phenomenal. Um, gave them an opportunity to, to just refocus and, and get their heads out of, out of combat for a while. Right. And then, then in December, um, all hell broke loose in, on the, the Eastern front. Um, the, uh, the German army surprised, uh, 
General Eisenhower and his staff and, and, and came pounding through the Arden Forest and, and nobody expected it. Right. And that began, that began the Battle of the Bulge. Now, this part of your book, I truly appreciated and I enjoyed it very much. And I don't think I quite understood the kind of different points of view that Eisenhower and Montgomery, Monty, General Montgomery had, because Eisenhower was like, we want a broad front. Let's just push along the entire line. Let's truly liberate Paris and not, I mean, excuse me, France and not just a part of it. Whereas I think Monty wanted to like laser focus, gather some men and just push on into the uh, the Ruhr Valley where the Krupp um, arms manufacturer and other manufacturers were because mm. he knew it would hurt the war effort. But, but Eisenhower was like, no, we need to, you know, so they had to work that out. But in, in some ways, it doesn't matter. Well, the, they, yeah, go ahead. The, the, I'm sorry. The the uh, uh, the Allied Supreme Command mm -hmm. when they when they planned D Day, they also planned the after action, and the after action was going to be if D Day went well and they were able to push the Germans back, right. they were going to march them right into Germany. Ah, um, and and as as they. Uh, got closer and closer to the, uh, the French German border. Uh, Montgomery was, was petitioning Eisenhower to, uh, to take this action up, up North through Holland, uh, that was ultimately called, uh, market garden. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and you're right. His, his goal, his objective was, was to push down from the North and, and devastate the, the German manufacturing. Uh, war war manufacturing effort, and uh, so he convinced. Uh, and I'm sure there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of politicking going on in the background. <laughs> uh, but he he convinced Eisenhower to put the the uh, eastward push on hold mm -hmm. uh, and divert resources to Montgomery and. Um, so what it ended up happening was, was the allied front stopped, um, along the German border. And, and it was like, I think it was something like a 900 mile front wow. and they basically camped out and, um, there were skirmishes here and there, but the Germans weren't really putting up anything more than, than probing efforts. And, and the, the Americans were, were getting, Lackadaisical thinking that they were, um, you know, they were they were okay to to relax and and take it easy because nobody expected the German army to come through the Ardennes forest, right? And even though the German army did that in in 1940, um, and even though the German army did that in in was it 1915. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they had the, the, they had established their credentials and their, and their battle plan strategy. And the German army, the Wehrmacht was, was really pretty predictive, I think, because they had the same battle plan in pretty much throughout World War II. Right. And when they went to, went into Prussia, they went into Russia, they went, went into France and Belgium and Holland. Um, it was the same battle plan. It, it was a, a blitzkrieg and, and they had the technology and the, and the mechanized army that was unmatched in the rest of Europe. So they were able to quickly overcome and overwhelm their, their opponents. And, and that's how they gained so much ground so fast. Mm. Yeah, if, Winston if, Churchill said. Right. Winston Churchill said that that, that um, before 1942, the German army never lost a, a battle, and after 1942, they never won a battle. <laughs> I remember. And what happened in what happened in 1942? Uh, the Americans got involved. Oh yes, Churchill knew how to. He knew how to talk to his American cousins. He knew what he was doing. So. <laughs> 
we we could easily sit here for hours and talk about the Battle of the Bulge, but of course, I think we should just narrow it to to kind of Gordon in the five seventeenth uh, part of it. But again, you, you make the point in your book about the Americans pretty much just stop, so uh, Monty can do his thing. But that dovetails nicely with exactly what Hitler wants to do. He has a second big um, recruitment. He gathers up all these people from age what was it sixteen to sixty? I can't remember exactly, and he just comes. Oh, yeah barreling through and of course the americans and the british and the french and everybody else in western europe are totally not ready for this so now it's the allies who've got to scramble and try to stop the germans from making it all the way either to the sea or to antwerp i'm trying to remember well i think hitler had had uh accepted the fact that he wasn't going to beat the russians right uh and and the only way to pr- protect his his uh uh, flank on the left was was to attack to be aggressive, mm-hmm. and in, in fact, um, I think the I think the German general staff really didn't want to do that. Right. Um, but but Hitler was Hitler, and, and he ordered it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, and and so they had to, to fall in line and and, and uh, take their orders and and do his bidding. So. Uh, when they when they busted through the Ardennes forest, mm-hmm. um, they they did that at several points along the front, and what they were doing was was really probing for an opening that where they could break through and divide the the Allied line. Right. And to Eisenhower's credit and 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 his general staff's credit, they were able to to assess the situation and plug those gaps mm-hmm. and in one one scenario and in, in uh, that gordon was involved in was uh, uh was in hotton hotton is on on the river uh with part of the village on on the the west side of the river part of the village on the on the east side of the river mm-hmm. and that was right outside of the arden force and um the uh uh, so th- there was a uh, there was an armored uh, division, a small element of an armored division that was was basically camping out in in Hotton. So when the the bulge started, they were under intense fire, mm-hmm. but the Germans hadn't come across the river yet. So Eisenhower sent troops in to to plug that gap, and one of the one of the units that was sent in was the 517th. So they were they were charged with with making their way into Hotton and and rescuing this uh, uh, armored division, and wow. um, and they did it and and they did it in a matter of days. Um, That's incredible. The, the sad thing about the 517th and the sad thing about the the, the whole Allied effort was that I think it, in the end, there were some 80, 84% casualties across the board. Um, so that's, that's pretty heavy. And, and, yeah. you know, when you, when you've gone through training with these guys and, and you're, you're into, uh, uh, you know, the dead of winter, uh, a year and a half with them, uh, and, and losing them, uh, left and right. That's, mm-hmm. that's got to be psychologically tough. Gordon is now a staff sergeant, if I'm if I've got this right, leading a light machine gun platoon. And yeah, I mean, this is the time where leadership steps up where he's got to say, yes, I miss all those guys, too. And I'm devastated just like you are. But we have a job to do. And I think he he did a very good job of being able to keep them focused and motivated because that's what you have to do with troops, uh, because the fighting is not over. It's it's far from over and they've got to stay focused on the task. Yeah, um, phenomenal. When you start looking at the numbers of uh, mm-hmm. the uh, uh, aircraft and um, and tanks that are, are that the Germans sent into into this battle, right? Uh, and the Americans are just uh, scrambling, trying to to plug the holes and stop it. Um, you know, Bastogne itself, I think, lasted. I don't know how long Bastogne lasted, but but they were they were under intense fire for. Uh, for a long time, and and these other battles were going on around Bastogne, um, and and many of them you don't really hear about, but but they're every bit as as important and and as intense as Bastogne was. 
Right. Now, I, I find this interesting because we're talking about the Battle of the Bulge and we're zoomed out. Obviously, that was many decades ago, almost like it was a chess match. But before the 517th and other units were sent in, they did get words uh, word that some German SS troops had massacred a large number of American prisoners from the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion. So, yes, they're going in. Yes, they're scared because, oh, my God, you know, we got to stop the Germans. But at the same time, you get the sense that they wanted some payback or they wanted some revenge or, or at the very least they were, I guess, hoping to make sure that that same fate did not happen to them. Yeah. At Mal, uh, I think it's at Malmedy, um, uh, Belgium, the uh, Germans had, had uh, executed a large number of American prisoners or they were allied prisoners. There were, there were uh, British in there as well. Right. Um, and, um, that word got out. Some there were some survivors that escaped that, and um, and the word got out, got back to the American troops, and and um, in in a way, it was a good thing because it it convinced them that it, if they were thinking about surrendering to uh, a, a German right. uh, attacking them, um, that would convince them not to do it. Good point. Um, because they're, you know, better to have a rifle in your hand and, and get shot than, than not have one to get shot. Right. So, and that, you know, yeah. to, to, you know, in, in the fog of war, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes men get angry and they, and they, uh, their anger, you know, overtakes their senses. And, and so some of those atrocities happen on both sides, which is unfortunate. Sure. Absolutely. So we've got this 19 year old kid. Um, he's good with the 517th. They fought in Italy. They fought in southern France. And now they're helping with the um, Battle of the Bulge. I think they were just north of Easy Company from the Band of Brothers. Uh, but uh, if you can give us an idea maybe of what happens as far as at least Gordon goes with his combat experience, maybe into late 1944, early 1945. Um, because we're getting close to the end here, uh, at least as far as his World War II his career. But if you can give us an idea of some of his other experiences, uh, that might help us uh, begin to end uh, this part of his story. Sure. He so the the uh, he was leading a, a, a light machine gun platoon, and uh, they were on the attack. They were um, they were tasked with. Um, capturing uh, commanding ground at, at Haid Hits, mm -hmm. uh, capturing the high ground at, at sur les Hees, uh, and clearing the woods on, on both sides of the road. Um, they had to, to maintain a, a line of resistance between Soy and Hotton, which was uh, the road between Soy and Hotton, mm -hmm. and then break through to, to uh, rescue the 3rd Armored Division that was garrisoned uh, in Hotton and surrounded and they accomplished all of those objectives. Um, you know, it, 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 it's it's amazing. These guys have been in, in combat off and on for six months, right? And and yeah. they performed admirably. They they did what they were expected to do. Uh, um, they were able to uh, uh, cover their objectives. Uh, they never lost a battle. Uh, they lost a, a heck of a lot of men, but, but they, they won their objectives, um, for the most part. That that's incredible. Yeah. Because you're right. I mean, someone sat down and said, we need highly trained troops because this is going to get ugly and they do do the job, but you're right. They, they suffered a lot. They lost a lot of friends along the way. Uh, now I want the listeners to know that we have only touched like one third of the book because Gordon will go on and he will fight in uh, North the, the Korean war. He will fight in Vietnam. So there's plenty that we have left out, but I really wanted to touch on his experiences in world war II. Um But, but uh, Robert, if you can give us an idea of a little bit of what Gordon will be up to in the coming years, um, that might be a good place to stop because if I remember correctly, he did not finish high school. It's not like he's married. I mean, he kind of put his life on hold for the war and then pretty soon his part in the war is going to be over. And I guess it's to a degree, it's time to return to some kind of normalcy. Yeah. He, um, 
so he uh, he did get his his high school diploma after after the war. Um, right. He was a second lieutenant then, uh, and he elected to stay in the in the army and make it a career. Um, mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, during Korea, when uh, he was called up after Korea had started, and he um, he was thrown into the the middle of a of a battle uh, in Korea, where that's where he met his platoon. Right. Um, he was assigned to be the platoon leader, and and uh, uh, had to go join them in in the middle of a battle uh, because they had lost their their uh, lieutenant. Right. Um, and, uh, so he, uh, uh, picked up leadership of a, of a, a unit that was a, uh, a segregated, uh, uh, black unit. Uh, mm-hmm. it was actually a, one, one of the, the last remaining, uh, black companies in the army at the time. Right. And, um, had a, uh, had a storied history. They started out as Buffalo soldiers in, in the, the 19th century and, and had a, a, a good track record during World War I and, and World War II. And, and now here they are in, in, uh, in Korea, uh, pushing up and down the peninsula, um, you know, as, as that particular war seesawed back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, they would, they would take a hill, uh, Secure it, and the and the North Koreans and Chinese would come right back and 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 take it from them, oh. uh, and then the Americans would go take it back again. It was a it was a, a seesaw right. event. Um, but he he uh, he had his his combat chops from from uh, Viet, uh, from uh, World War Two, mm-hmm. and and he was able to apply that skill and that that. Uh, uh, knowledge and expertise and, and lead these guys, uh, to, uh, accomplish great things in, in Korea. Um, I, the, I, I don't know the numbers right off the top of my head, but a mm-hmm. large number of, of members of the 24th infantry regiment, which, which he was a member of, uh, had won, uh, medals of honor, uh, distinguished service cross, uh, silver stars, bronze stars, Right. Uh, I think uh, 2,000 uh, Purple Hearts, um, just incredible courage uh, uh, in that regiment. Right. That's incredible. Speaking of physical courage, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off if I did, but speaking of physical courage, I was near the end of the book, and this was burned into my memory. Uh, I will never forget it as long as I live. So I'm, I'm sitting there finishing up this book, this guy's incredible life. Yes, he was physically courageous. Yes, he was a great leader. He knew how to inspire his troops. He learned a long time ago, if you take care of your men, they will take care of you. But the part that really struck me, and I think he got this from his mother, you can tell me, was that just because I'm kind doesn't mean I'm weak. Kindness is not a weakness. Don't mess with me. And you've got to, and if you really do care about someone, you will tell them the honest, hard truth, no matter how much it hurts, because to do anything else is to be dishonest. And that's just not who he was. And so for all of the valor, for all the victories, for all of the courage, when I read that part of the book, I was like, this is the kind of guy I would want in my foxhole. And he just seemed like an absolutely, uh, just a stellar human being. Yeah, um, um, members members of his family um, of our family um, have said that that uh, he was a saint. Uh, and just every time every time they met him, um, he was courteous. He was uh, he was a gentleman. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, he took care of everybody. Um, uh, there are there are family stories that I can't put in the book and I can't talk about here, but but sure. just. You're, as you said, there are, are uh, he's the kind of guy that you would want in your foxhole. He's the kind of guy that you would want to be your best friend. Yes. Um, he's, uh, he's incredibly gracious, um, um, humble, uh, yet very strong and, and uh, very determined in what he wanted to accomplish. I would just imagine if he was my friend or in my life, I would have been a much better person for it just because, I mean, how do you not see someone exuding that kind of confidence and leadership and not have it rub off? But again, I will, will say that for the readers because readers, believe me, we've barely touched this book. There's 
there was like at least 180 to 200 pages that we didn't talk about. And and I just have to say this real quick. And he he eventually gets married when he gets out of World War II. He they can't have children, so they adopt three children. So what what's not to love about this guy? But anyway, uh, Mr. Lovehouse, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for this book. And one more time, it is Honor Through Sacrifice, the story of one of America's greatest military leaders. Uh, can you remind me of when this book is coming out, please? Sure. Uh, it's due to be published October the 5th. Okay. Do you know if, the, if um, and, and you probably don't know, it's no big deal. Um, do you know if um, there's a, a, a window of pre-ordering for people or do they pretty much need to wait until then? Um, actually, we, we will be uh, uh, opening up a, a pre-order opportunity um, through Kickstarter in uh, late August or early September. Okay, good. So should people just search your name? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, you can, you can go, you can go to uh, my, uh, my blog site and, and see details on that as we get closer to those dates. Um, That, that address is www.holdtheline.press. Okay, perfect. And so for those of you that buy it and read it, I'm just telling you now, when you get near the end of the book, maybe you want to be alone, you might tear up a little bit. I certainly did, but it was a, it was a heck of a roller coaster ride of a story. And again, I just thank you very much for your time and for being with us today. Thank you, Ray. Many thanks. I enjoyed the conversation. At Clean Choice, we believe the best parts of this world are the simple things. How do we help protect it for future generations? The good news is that it's never been easier to help preserve those simple joys with Clean Choice Energy. Switching to clean electricity is one of the simplest and biggest ways you can help the environment. There's no new equipment needed, no home visit necessary. It only takes two minutes to sign up. Visit cleanchoice.com slash podcast to learn how simple clean energy can be. That's cleanchoice.com slash podcast.